So the idea here is that you would have tubes incorporated into the center of blades within the wind turbine, which are hollow anyway, and that within these tubes you will see some free-running masses that are capable of traveling under the influence of gravity. So as the tube drops below the horizontal, a mass will fall down it, and as one rises towards the vertical, a mass will fall down that. We will have times when the amount of electricity being generated by the wind is more than the total demand for the whole country. To start with, they do look like gobbledygook, but then you sort of work out what the individual bits do, and you can very quickly sort of look at a line of code, I guess very much like you'd look at a sentence of a foreign language, and work out what the bits do and what sort of the net effect of that line is. <laughs> Mission accomplished, <laughs> I think, I hope. So this is that popliteus tendon yeah. coming in. Um, which is much bigger on sheep than people. I'm dealing with sharp needles and my hands get cold and slightly numb and the coordination goes. So if I don't cover my hands up, I very quickly start stabbing myself. The temperature I've got the room set at is the uh, average mean temperature of the uh, soil. And some sort of playing with my bike and things, my toys. I always used to be quite interested in sort of what made them work, sort of behind behind the scenes. So I guess I've kind of always had that kind of curiosity to know how things work, and really science is kind of the the thing that sort of explains that, I guess. I don't think I regarded it at the time as science, or right? it was more curiosity about how things worked. Yeah, I was a science geek. I was born a science geek. Curiosity about things like tomatoes, why they went red. Uh, I was very much into sort of space stories, spaceships. Um, I've wanted to be a scientist ever since John Pertwee was a doctor. Uh, surprise that uh, when I put green tomatoes in the dark that they went red. Well, I had the classic chemistry set and sort of managed to um, blow up parts of the kitchen. I always associated uh, redness with sunlight. Why do you have species? So why can't you know dogs and cats have babies? Was a very basic question I can remember. Getting into trouble when I was five. Um, there was an area of um, what I now realise was cement on the playground at school. I remember doing a project in like primary school, and you had to make a battery circuit. So what I did, of course, everyone else was avoiding running over it. I thought, well, why are they doing that? So why don't I run over it? So I ran over it. And when you connected the circuit, a light bulb was meant to go on. You meant to make it exciting and crazy because for primary school they want it to be fun. And of course, there's a footprint left uh, in the wet, drying concrete, uh, and so it's something quite difficult to try and deny that you're guilty because clearly you're going to get matched up. And there I was, and uh, arrayed in front of the whole school as, as the guilty culprit. So, but I just wanted to find out why people were avoiding it. And I've hid my battery in a little guy, and so when he clapped his hands, the light went on above his head. I got a special prize for that. That was the first time I thought, hey, I can do this. This is easy science. All I remember was that apparently at a parents' evening, one of the teachers told them I had a very good flair for chemistry. So you equate the sound with what's actually we're seeing. We can see there's some tail back, so it means that the water's going in at the top and then coming back out very slightly uh, lagging between when it goes in and comes out. Well, I guess I was really more into maths and science. Uh, I loved all things numerical and loved playing around with formulae and, and that sort of thing. I made any number of uh, oscillators, uh, electrical things that just went buzz from a battery. That was absolutely fascinating. So actually the thing which I really loved when I was very little was maths. It was nice and easy, it was logical, I could do it. And it's only when I started getting into my teens that maths started being a bit boring as I thought, what was the point? I made a kind of uh, primitive uh, arithmetic teaching tool which just involved making circuits and it was all made with thumbtacks pushed into a board with crude wires and a light bulb powered by a battery. And so at that point I started getting into the astrophysics but physics at school to be honest really bored me. And I made countless kites of all descriptions uh, including some that had three strings on not, not your two string kite so that you could control uh, lift as well as side to side movement. Um, and some of those plummeted with relatively disastrous results, I'm sorry to say, but it was all fun.
Does everybody have um, all of the things that are on the list? There's a sort of a, an elevated area. We can then work out the total mass of arsenic per square metre. We're basically taking samples and uh, in situ measurements which will allow us to calculate mass balances for certain key elements including um, a couple of nutrient elements, um, uh, potassium and carbon and a couple of trace elements, zinc and, and arsenic and that's it really, it's just to see where these things are. This is the third year I've done this particular exercise and every year we've come here we've had rain or, or mist or uh, pretty uh, grotty conditions underfoot but uh, you know that's, uh, that's field work in October for you. Tough, yeah you might have, a, you might have hit Cornwall or something. <laughs> it's just you know cut me in half and it's got scientists written all the way through like a stick of rock you know it's that's that's the way I am. It's, a, it's an early morning lecture nine o'clock so it should wake them up. I think when the boxes start to arrive, it's always very, very exciting, uh, and they start to set things up. But actually, it's the start of uh, a long haul. We've now got this working, and working how we want it to get it to work. Uh, now we've got to do the experiments, and then we've got to interpret the results, which may be non-trivial. <laughs> we have a PowerPoint and on it is a selection of slides of pictures and we've asked the children put your hands up if you see a scientist and you can put your hands up more than once. Yeah, we have pictures of people drilling boreholes through ice at the North Pole dressed as Eskimos and space walks and people swinging from trees collecting samples from, uh, from flowers or whatever. And we've got the typical scientist wearing the white lab coat looking down a microscope. Um, Generally, children still put up their hands for the white lab coat. Do you have your own coat or do you share coats? <laughs> it's mine. <laughs> Usually because if you don't write your name on the back, you come back and uh, you find that the only one that's uh, available is uh, for a small midget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the boffin question. I guess it's the uh, idea from Frankenstein, the guy in the white coat hopping around saying it's alive. It's alive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people do think of the scientists as a uh, sort of nerdy geek, usually male, um, usually white. Uh, and I think, you know, there's something that as a scientist you do have to be aware of those preconceptions. But, you know, science is a, is a social occupation just like anything else. We do things in big teams. We have our good days, we have our bad days. In that sense, it's like any other job. I don't know what a typical sort of scientist is, really. I think because science is such a wide area, um, wide discipline, that you can find sort of people operating in very different ways. I guess where it's not um, like any other job is that sometimes it's quite difficult to let go because you've got, you're on the verge of a big discovery. It's big competition in that sense. You might be like a you know, member of a big football team or something like that. You've got to get there first. You've got to, you know, you've got to score the goal before the opposition does. So, you know, we're competitive people, but I don't think we're, I think the stereotypes are, are lagging a little bit behind, but we have to change that. No, there's no such thing as a stereotypical scientist. Um, uh, uh, science is part and an integral part of modern life. A normal looking chap uh, uh, waiting for the bus at the bus stop uh, who fumbles around from time to time, uh, who enjoys uh, what he or she is doing. The stereotype of geeky middle-aged men in lab coats simply isn't the truth at all. On the other hand, I guess most scientists do have a sort of common approach to, to their work and probably to life in general that tends to be quite methodical and analytic. So there are some stereotypical characteristics, but I wouldn't say there is a stereotypical person. And I think the best thing for scientists is not to uh, uh, feel that in any way that they're isolated uh, 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 from humankind, as it were. That's I'll, one of I'll... my pet peeves, actually. The number of times I'm told I don't look like a scientist is... <laughs> We are all part of uh, human activities and human race and uh, we are enjoying ourselves and relating our subject to our fellow human beings.